In this video, we will talk about potential risk factors for tendinopathy. Enroll in our online course now. Link is in the video description. Hi and welcome back to PhysioTutors. Tendinopathy has a multifactorial etiology that is not well understood. Risk factors are often separated into extrinsic factors, so those acting on the body from the outside, and intrinsic factors, so all factors acting from within the body. In the narrative review, Peter Maliaras and Seth O'Neill discuss three different classes of risk factors. They are looking at one, load-related, so extrinsic factors, two, biomechanical intrinsic factors, and three, other individual and systemic factors which can be classified as intrinsic as well. Let's start with load-related extrinsic factors. Repetitive stretch shortening cycles of the muscle tendon unit, such as walking and running for Achilles tendinopathy or jumping for patella tendinopathy are associated with tendinopathy. The tendon load may only be able to explain part of the story. In running and submaximal hopping, the Achilles tendon load is reported to be 6 to 8 times and 8 to 10 times body weight respectively, while the load during maximal isometric plantar flexion contraction is only 3.5 times body weight. On the other hand, the load on the patella tendon during squatting is similar to a spike jump takeoff with 4.8 times body weight and 5.2 times body weight respectively. The crucial difference between fast and high load activities and slow and high load activities, like in rehab, is the tendon loading rate. While in squatting it is about 1 to 2 times body weight per second, it is as high as 40 times body weight per second in a spike jump takeoff. This probably explains why tendinopathy is associated with repetitive stretch shortening cycles, while slow and heavy loading is not. A classic study by Soslowski et al. in the year 2002 manipulated mice so that one group had an enlarged acromial roof, another group was overloaded by downhill running, and a third group had both external compression and overload combined. The results of that trial showed that compression alone did not lead to pathology, but a combination of compressive and tensile loads was more damaging than tensile loads alone. Change in load. The most common cause for tendinopathy are training errors involving sudden changes in load. This encompasses any fluctuations in intensity, frequency or duration of exercise or combination of all of the three. For this reason, tendinopathy is often seen in athletes in pre-season after a holiday break. Like mentioned before, important is a change in energy storage type of loads as they stress the tendon the most. When taking patient history in patients in who you suspect tendinopathy, ask for hill or speed sessions, marathon or similar events, if they have bought a sports watch or Fitbit which motivates them to push harder, preseason breaks or a change in shoes or training surface. Higher load duration, intensity and frequency are associated with patella pain and Achilles tendinopathy. This fits the evidence of Magnussen et al. in 2010 who have found that repeated intense loading without sufficient recovery may be a risk factor for tendon pathology. Be aware that this association is not consistent, however, and that a change in load may be a confounder in this relationship. Now let's look at biomechanical factors. Individual biomechanics, including movement kinetics and kinematics, foot posture, flexibility, neuromuscular capacity, and structural anatomy may influence tendinopathy risk. However, the relationship between biomechanics and the development of tendinopathy is a real mess. If you want to have a look at individual articles, we can highly recommend you to start with this narrative review of Malieras and O'Neill. In general, it seems that extremes in biomechanics might be risk factors worth paying attention to during rehab. For example, both increased and decreased dorsiflexion are described as risk factors in the development of Achilles tendinopathy. The same is true for increased as well as decreased hamstring flexibility for patella tendinopathy. The link between neuromuscular changes and pain is even less clear. 
comparable to other body regions and pathologies, cross-sectional studies don't allow us to say if neuromuscular impairments such as decreased strength are a consequence of pain or if they are a risk factor leading to tendon pain. For our rehab, this means the following. While a good loading program is necessary for all patients, interventions to target biomechanical factors and neuromuscular changes might be necessary for some patients who are at the extreme ends of a spectrum. Similar to other body regions and with all the individual variation, posture and movement between individuals, it's really difficult to say which posture or movement is faulty. At last, if we do assume to have found a biomechanical or neuromuscular factor, the question is if we are able to change those factors by therapy in the first place. Multiple systemic factors have been linked with tendinopathy, including age, high cholesterol, adiposity, and genetics. These systemic risk factors are thought to reduce the capacity of the tissue to tolerate load, gradually altering tendon capacity so that an extra walk, a quick dash across the road, or a day spent gardening may be sufficient to overload the tendon, triggering symptoms. Systemic factors might also play a greater role in case of bilateral involvement or in tendinopathy, where load seems to play a smaller role, such as in pass and serinus tendinopathy. Furthermore, these systemic factors combined with biomechanics might be able to explain why under similar loading conditions, some athletes develop tendinopathy and others don't. Finally, cognitive and emotional factors such as anxiety, illness beliefs and fear avoidance behavior can influence a person's pain experience and should not be disregarded. The Envelope of Function by Scott Dye beautifully summarizes the risk factors involved in the etiology of tendon pain. So the envelope of function is the load frequency distribution defining the safe or homeostatic range of load acceptance. So if the combination of load and frequency exceed your envelope of function, it will lead to pathology. It's also interesting to see that suboptimal loading may lead to disuse effects, which we know is especially a problem in tendons. Peter Malieras adds that biomechanics can directly influence the load in this graph. On a site, systemic and individual factors will all have an influence on an individual's propensity to develop pain. All right, this was our video on risk factors for tendinopathy. We hope you enjoyed this video, and if you love tendons and would like to learn more about the topic, check out our video on the seven absolutely crucial facts about tendons you probably didn't know by a click to my right. As always, thanks a lot for watching, and this was Kai for Physio Tutors. I'll see you next time, bye.